and he just reaches across and opens the door and my heart starts to panic because why isn't he getting out? When I came back, my father was strung out on crack and he was an alcoholic. I'm the girl your therapist warned you about. You better run. Thanks for clicking on Simply Tanika. I am Tanika. If you are new here, welcome. Hit that subscribe button. Let's hang out a while. If you are returning, welcome back. What's up, fertility fam? We gotta do what? Let's get those babies, ladies. What's up, fertility fam? How are you? I hope you are well. So today I'm going to talk about my father abandoning me. I had a lot of comments, a lot of questions about why or if I'm looking for a husband, like come to Texas, some of you guys inviting me down, which is awesome. Or why don't I, why do I want to have a known donor contract with Blue? And I've said it in a few videos before that I have commitment issues and I've explained I think well I touched on some of the issues with my dad but I wanted to dedicate a full video let's talk about it <sighs> when I was conceived my father was 26 years old he was married and he had a little boy named Victor who is my older brother he lived in a town called Madera California his wife was not my mother my mother was 17 years old and she lived in a town called Fresno, California. Both of them are very small towns. Madera has one stoplight. So in that regard, Fresno is a big city. My father liked to race cars. Um, he had a Camaro or Trans Am or something fast. My mom liked fast cars. My mother was orphaned at the age of 14. Her mother died. Um, her mother had run away from New York. She lived in the Bronx. She ran away and moved to California. Whole other story. Worked in a brothel as a housekeeper. A brothel owned by her Aunt Emily. She had children. Um, when she went to California, I believe my Auntie Wanda said that my grandmother was pregnant with her. And then she had my mother and she went on to have four more children, I think it is. At any rate, she passed away when my mother was 14. So my mother was adopted by the woman that I know as my grandmother, um, Mrs. Florence Porter. So there she was, three years ago orphaned, 17, and here comes this guy in a fast car. And there was this, I don't know, admiration, I think, I wanna say I obviously wasn't there. I only hear the retelling, not only from my mother, um, but from her sisters and other family members. So. At 17, my mom ends up pregnant with the child of a married man. As she has retold it to me, she wasn't really keen on carrying the pregnancy to term. I was born in 71, May of 71, so I was conceived in 70. Roe versus Wade, which is what allows you in America to have an abortion, had not been passed yet. So I don't know when she says she wasn't keen on carrying me to full term if she considered abortion or not. She was raised Catholic, so I don't think so. But whatever rate, as she tells it, he convinced her to carry the pregnancy to full term and that's how I got here. I don't really remember a lot of him from when I was little, but apparently he was around for a little while. Um, he would come over with diapers and hang out and spend the night or whatever. And at that time she was staying with my grandmother. We didn't leave my grandmother's house until I was five. Around the time that we left her house, which I remember because I had started kindergarten, I don't remember seeing my father anymore. Like I had early memories, like I remember kindergarten very clearly. I don't remember my father. I remember who my mom was dating at the time. I remember a purple bedspread. I don't remember my father. My father also was in a motorcycle club. Don't call it a gang, it's a club. The Unknown Riders. And so he was, you know, pretty popular man about town. He had a fast car, had motorcycles, good looking, very good looking man. He always wore cowboy boots. I remember that. He was about 5'7 or 5'8, but he always wore cowboy boots. It wasn't a big thing. It was, like I said, both of them were small towns. They were country. I'm a country girl. 
So my aunt Wanda, who, you know, knew the whole story, knew everything that was going on, knew my father, would see him out in this place uh, called Roading Park. It was a popular place for people to hang out uh, in my hometown, Fresno, on the weekends. And so she would occasionally see him. And for whatever reason, she wanted him to be a part of my life. And so when she would see him, she would get his phone number, she would give it to my mom. My mom would not follow up. At some point, I think before my eighth birthday, my aunt decided to give me the number or give me the number and have a conversation in front of my mother. Um, it's not something that she would have crossed my mother on or went behind her back about, but there was some, you know, sly kind of way to get me involved. And of course, I wanted to be a part of my father's life. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. I remember we lived on Tulare Street. I think I was in, at this point, I want to say third grade, maybe? I don't know. But anyway, I remember I was a Girl Scout. I wanted to go to a carnival. My mom would not take me to carnival. So my mom was a single parent. At that point, she had my little brother, Effion, and he was probably around two. She worked a lot of jobs. That woman worked a lot of jobs and she was going to school. So at any rate, she could not take me to the carnival. My grandmother could not take me to the carnival. And at this point now, my grandmother was living with us before we had lived with her. Anyway, so I called my dad. I had this number, I called him and I wanted to go to the carnival. <laughs> I wanted to go to the carnival with my dad. And so I called him to take me to the carnival. He said that he would. He picked me up to take me to the carnival. He opened up, uh, he had a pickup truck. He opened up the pickup truck. He did it. I remember he reached across me from the inside of the pickup truck. He did not go outside of the car, of the truck and open the door for me. So I'm sitting in the passenger seat in the front seat and he just reaches across and opens the door. And my heart starts to panic because why isn't he getting out? Then he gets out and I'm relieved. He gets out, reaches into his back pocket and pulls out his wallet and is like, how much money do you think you're gonna need? And so I was like, I don't know. I don't need any money. I think I was scared to take money from him. I, don't, I wasn't sure what my mother would think and I was kind of offended at that point. I didn't know what was going on but I had the sense that he was about to leave me. He was like, well, I can't leave you here with no money. So I think he gave me something like 20 bucks. He walked around and kind of pressed it into the palm of my hand. And he left. He left. And looking back at it now, I would be mortified if someone had picked up my eight-year-old daughter and just left her there. Uh, I would be mortified to even think about doing it to my own daughter. At the time, I was scared because I thought I was going to be in trouble with my mother. I couldn't tell her that he had left me. I couldn't go home, so I had to go into the carnival. I had to go into the carnival, I had to think of how I was gonna get myself home. So I am there, it's in the evening, um, it's getting dark. Obviously the carnival is lit, like there, it's at a school playground type of like parking lot playground. Um, it's one of those like um, traveling carnivals, it's not there all the time. And so I meet up with some girls who are in my Girl Scout troop and I kind of tag along with them all night. And then when they get ready to go, they're like, how are you gonna get home? And I was like, oh, I don't know. My dad was supposed to pick me up. Um, I don't know where he is. So they're like, well, we'll wait for you. They're like, what time, whatever. And um, you know, eight o'clock, okay, we'll wait for you. This is way before cell phone. So they're like, well, why don't we take you home? So I was like, thank God. So they dropped me off. And I don't tell my mom that story until I'm an adult. Because I thought she was gonna be angry with me, one which I don't know why, I just thought she was gonna be mad. Probably because she really didn't want me to call my dad, but it's one of those things that, a recurring theme, I would say, when she was like, well, ask your dad. And so I did in that instance, and it was, I feel like a horrible person because I was kind of smug about it. Like, oh, my dad is gonna pick me up. Little did I know, my dad was gonna pick me up and drop me off. So I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed to tell my mom that even though my dad picked me up, he just left me. But I was still very much in love with my father and so I didn't want to tell her either because I didn't want her to say you can't see him anymore or that she would yell at him or whatever which he should have been yelled at but I was afraid that that would mean I wouldn't get to see him and here I am this eight-year-old girl who was trying to build this relationship with her father. He couldn't have cared less. He couldn't have cared less. At this point he has another wife not the wife that he was married to when I was created. He's married someone else. And she has two twin girls and a son and a very lovely wife named Irene. 
or she is the lovely wife name I read. He has a wife. And God bless her, she always treated me like I was her own. So she would come to my birthday parties and she would bring the girls and she would invite me over. So I would go over because I would get to see my dad. Not that he paid any attention to me. I remember her coming over and I, we were still on Larry. She brought a gift, she brought a Barbie. And I remember was this very specifically because my aunt was not, didn't mince her words. Irene bought me a Barbie that had blonde streaks in her hair. My aunt thought it looked like a hooker and that it was inappropriate. She gave it to me and she said it was from my dad. And now as an adult, I know it wasn't, but it meant so much to me that my dad gave me a birthday present. And so I was very upset with my Aunt Wanda, who is my favorite aunt. I was very upset with her that she was making a big deal that this doll had blonde streaks in its hair. And this is like mid seventies where they started trying to make the Barbies more ethnically authentic. Not like they are today, but they started to make a star where it wasn't like before they were, they had all Caucasian features and they just made them brown. So she kind of, in my mind, looked like me. So that was one incident that sticks out with me about my dad. It was going to be a thing. There were so many times in between where I was so excited to see him. I remember riding on the motorcycle with him with no helmet. Um, I had really long hair and my mom used to relax it. It was just long and wild and I, I was tender headed. I, I remember riding on the back of the motorcycle with him and just holding on to him for dear life. And it was the best feeling in the world because I was with my dad. And in my mind, he was like this big strong man and he was gonna protect me. He was my dad. He wasn't like my mom's boyfriend or one of my uncles or a teacher, he was my father, like, and the two of us looked a lot alike. Like, if you saw my dad, I'm pretty much a female version of him. I have a younger sister from my father, Jamie, and we look, like, ridiculously alike. Even when I see her, it's kind of freaky because we also have similar facial expressions and hand gestures, and we didn't grow up together, so it's, that's my dad's gene. So, but he would disappear, so he was gone. At some point we got into a rhythm where I would go over to his house in the summers. He had a swimming pool, so we'd go over there and hang out. I'd hang out with the twins, and then my other brothers would come. So remember I said when my dad had me, he had an older son, Victor. Well then he stayed with that wife and had another son, Brian. So I'm in between his children with his wife. I would hang out with the kids over the summer. We would do things, my dad had an auto body shop. We would do things like work on cars, me and the boys. And I mostly hung out with the boys. I didn't really hang out with the girls. I was very much a tomboy, very needy, obviously, um, because I wanted attention, very flamboyant because I wanted attention. Um, I was in acting, I was in singing, all of those things. I really wanted to impress my father. I really wanted him to love me and I thought if I was smart and accomplished things he would be proud of me and he would love me. I won a beauty pageant. I was like Miss Teen, Miss Black Teen, Miss Galaxy something um, when I was 16 and I made it in the newspaper and I think my dad's friends mentioned it and so he kind of like oh you're in the, I don't know if he was proud or not but he, he paid attention to me. I did a play. I was in the play. It was like the first interracial, or not interracial, like, in, yeah, I guess. Like, I was the only black person in the play, and then my family members were white. So, multicultural is what it call was called. So, I made it in the Fresno Bee, which was the hometown paper. When I graduated from high school, my mom's aunt, Darlene, took me to get my nails done, or before graduation, something, graduation prompt, something. She took me to get my nails done. The woman who did my nails, had this accent. She sounded like my father. And like I said, Madeira is a smaller town. It is country. Fresno is country too, but Madeira is country. She sounded like my dad. She had that same country twin. Something about her, I don't know. I told her that. You sound like my father. She said, who's your father? And I said his name. And she said, that's my brother. I was like, oh my God, you're my aunt. She was like, he doesn't have any daughters. 
or he doesn't have any daughters your age because at this point my sister Jamie would have been born. I was like, no, he's my dad. And she looked at me. I mean, again, I look like him, but she's denied me. She denied me. And that had been a theme throughout my life. Like I didn't know any of my relatives on my father's side. I met one of his other sisters who was at his house when he lived with um, Irene. She had a pistol. She was a pistol. She was indifferent to me. She was nice, but she wasn't like, you're my niece. But she wasn't like, oh my God, you're my niece. Take down my number, come and see me. You know, she was like, you're not his daughter. I've skipped, I've skipped one thing. There was one more thing when I was 16. My dad was proud of me when I did the pageant and I won the pageant, which now I think it was, I was 15. When I was 16, I got a car for my birthday. I started a job on my birthday. I was very busy, like I said, I was into a lot of things. I was acting, singing, pageants, plays. My mom got me a car more out of necessity for herself because she was driving me around everywhere. And so this was more like, here, you can have your own schedule. Thank you very much. Oh, I was a cheerleader too. So we had to get up at some ungodly hour. And when I was 16, she filed for child support. I don't know if it was also because of the car or not because of the car. I remember the car was an issue because I think my father felt if you can afford to buy her a car, you don't need money from me. Again, he had had the other two girls, the twins, Eric, the other son, and Jamie. Lisa and Leslie are older than me, the twins. They hadn't gotten cars. So that was a bone of contention. At any rate, my father asked for a blood test when my mother filed for child support. Now, mind you, he had not paid one cent. I don't think he'd given her any money since that $20 that I got at the carnival. She hadn't filed my entire life, and she filed when I was 16. He wanted a blood test. He contested it, and that broke my heart. Again, I look more like my dad than anybody else. That kind of put a wedge between us. And then when I asked him about it, I remember him saying he had bills to pay. And I mean, and he lived a nice life. Like it wasn't like he was living hand to mouth. He owned his own business. Like I said, he had the swimming pool. Like they bought the house. They had, the, it was an in-ground swimming pool. Cause I know some other places they have a bucket. It was an in-ground swimming pool. They remodeled the house to have the in-ground swimming pool. Um, his wife worked. It wasn't like he was, you know, hand them out at this point. And again, the oldest two children were adults. They were 19 at this point. But I remember that humiliation. I had to go down there. I had to take the blood test. My mom had to take the blood test. And then I'm waiting like for these results because I'm expecting an apology. And it's something you involve your kids in, but I wasn't there because now we're questioning the sex right like basically now you're saying my mom is slutty and you don't know whose child she could have come up with and so you're contesting it but he told me it was really more about financial reasons and he was gonna stall me being me the first like official job I had after McDonald's I worked at the district attorney's office the child support division what he said was not true that did not stall it payment is due from the day it is filed it's due from the day it's filed he may have delayed when he paid but he was not delaying the amount and when you paid was only impacting me because I was the child that needed to be supported. I go on to have Cheyenne. I, um, I move to LA. I come back because this is bothering me. And at that point I'm in therapy. I talked to my therapist. My therapist is like, talk to your dad. I talked to my dad. I told him how I felt. I told him how it impacted all of my relationships. Um, I was in an abusive relationship with Cheyenne's father. I left when she was a year old, mainly because it's not that I didn't want to get my ass beat anymore. It was because I didn't want my daughter to see me getting my ass beat. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's what it was. I sugarcoated it and said we fought each other and all of those sorts of things, but as a woman, you don't fight a man, and it was never my choice. I never swung first. Choking was his thing. He liked to choke me. I tell this to my father. I tell him I have um, trouble bonding, etc., commitment issues, and he flat out tells me, and at this point, he's a recovering alcoholic, so I've skipped over some years. I went away to Downers Grove in Illinois my senior year. When I came back, my father was strung out on crack, and he was an alcoholic. By the time we have this conversation, he's a recovered addict alcoholic and now owns group homes for other addicts and alcoholics, so he got it back together. But he tells me it's my fault. He tells me I have to take responsibility for it. I start seeing him more frequently because um, like when I was, I want to say before Cheyenne was born or right when Cheyenne was born because Cheyenne's father got a drug charge and in order to have the time reduced, he pleaded as a, as a user and then had to do, he went to jail, but then this was like in-home service, I don't know exactly. At any rate, they were there, he would have to go to AA meetings and so I would go to the AA meetings. I could see her father and I could see my father. And they go around the room and they kind of talk about like what is going on in that room. I would speak and in that way, like in some sort of passive aggressive way, I got to share my life with my dad. So we had gone through all of this first 
and about accountability and making amends. And so because my father had been an alcoholic and an addict, he was meant to make amends. And so when I went to him with this story, I thought he would make amends to me. But instead he said, well, that's your fault. You have to take responsibility for that. If you're having issues with men, you have to be accountable for that. That there's nothing I can do. And it stung. But I took it on the chin and he said, I asked him, how do we move forward? How do we move forward? He told me, I cannot be the father that you wanted me to be, but we can start over. And then he tells me, but I don't want you calling me just because you need things, because you need money or you need whatever. And it was so far from what I needed at that point in my life. But I agreed and I said, okay. At that time, like I said, I was living in Los Angeles. I had come back to Fresno and had this conversation with him. In 1997, my oldest brother, Victor, was arrested for <sighs> RICO Act, which means um, you're selling drugs, but like you're a kingpin. He was selling drugs in multiple states. So RICO is like a federal offense. He was selling it across federal lines. They burst into his girlfriend's house. He was married, but he was at his girlfriend's house. And there was a million dollars. They went right to where it was. So someone who was in the organization told them where it was right because it's sealed like how do you just come into a house and know where to break into the ceiling or the plaster so my brother goes to jail they find a kilo of cocaine at my father's house that has my brother's fingerprint on it my and it's the feds my father turns a federal witness against my brother my brother is now serving two life sentences <sighs> Whatever you think about the criminal justice system and your own accountability, um, I feel like my father could have stood silent and he didn't. At that point, my brother and I were very close. We are not, we haven't spoken. We haven't spoken since 2002. Verbally, we've emailed, we emailed in 2008 and it was nasty. It was when I moved to New York and it broke my heart because he was my other father figure. But anyway, I went to see my brother and he told me that my dad said, at that point my dad was sick, he had some kind of cancer and he said, I can't do the time. So I am going to take a plea. And part of that plea is, I've got to say these things on the record. They would not have convicted my brother without this testimony and the feds don't go after you like the feds have like a 95 96 percent conviction rate yeah so i just thought it was really selfish and at this point my father had another son dj i don't even know how old he is he's younger than cheyenne but he had another son and he was like i gotta be there for my son <laughs> which i just thought was like really shitty like you weren't there for us like why do you have to be there for this other one and it was nothing against the young one it was just it wasn't fair it wasn't fair. There was another time I remember riding in the car with my dad. I was maybe like 13, I think. No, because the kids were born already. My two sisters are the same age, right? One was by my mom, one was by my dad. They're both the same age. My older sisters are the same age too, the twins. They're both born in 83, the younger ones. I remember riding home with my dad because I had seen him with my sister Jamie and he was so loving. And I was like, oh my God, so he's capable of like loving little people. He's capable of loving children. Why can't he love me? And so I asked him and he just told me straight out he didn't love me. He was like, I can't explain it. I just don't have that feeling. He's like, when they're little, it's easy to love them. Well, I was little once too. At any rate, my father is dead now. And my Aunt Wanda, God bless her, when my father was really sick and on his deathbed, she found him, she found me, she told me that he was in the hospital and I should go and see him. And I didn't. I couldn't. I wouldn't. I felt like he had not honored me in living I was not going to honor him in death. I think your children are a blessing and you should do right by them. And if you do right by them, you will have their love always. They will be there for you always. I remembered when he said, the relationship we have going forward, let's work on it, but don't call me when you need something. And that's how I felt. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Don't call me when you need something. 
I don't know. I don't know. I remember talking to my younger brother later and he was like, you know, our dad died. And I was like, yep, I know. And it's, it's horrible because like when I saw my sister Jamie earlier last year, or maybe it was a couple years ago, there's this like disconnect between us because I know she loves that man so much and I'm sure his death was tragic to her, but not to me. And so, like, you would expect to have that connection with your siblings. Like, when my stepdad died, I had that connection with my sister, her father. But we, the relationships are different. The relationships are different. And so, yeah. There's this pattern of men leaving me, my father, many, many times back and forth. And I tried. I tried. Um, and in the end, I just felt like I wasn't going again to be left. Right? Because I was going to go and love him and say all these things about how I wish we would have had all these things. And maybe he would have said he loved me, but why? Because he was dying? Because he didn't say it when we were both well and living. And then he was going to leave me again. So I decided not to go. Um, and then my brother left. My brother went to prison. And I remember, you know, begging him not to leave me but well before this and he kept putting himself in situations um to leave me like he had already been in prison once this is his second stint and they gave him two life sentences so he's never coming home he went in at 30. we fell out because i didn't do something for him that he thought i should do and was really nasty about it i mean i'll take my looks too i was nasty back but i really am when i'm done with someone i'm done with them it's unfortunate. I mean, I will always love him, but I just can't be in a situation to be manipulated. And so those are like the major male hormone, like hallmarks in my life, right? Major male hallmarks. And that's my experience. So why would I be running off to get married? Why would I believe that someone who is not related to me is gonna love me till death do me part to have and to hold for richness? For richer or for poor, although when my sister got married, she said for richer or for richer, which was funny. So I think sometimes people are like, oh, when are you going to get a husband? Or they feel sorry for me. Don't feel sorry for me. This is a choice. This is a choice and I'm okay with it. I don't know if I will ever be married. I don't know if I'll ever live with someone else. There's some other stories I'll tell you guys. Like when I moved to New York with my high school sweetheart. 10 year, almost 11 years ago now. Well, it's another story for another time. But yeah, so that is the story of my father abandoning me. That is the story of why I am not looking for a husband and why I have commitment issues. I'm working on them. I am connected to Blue in a way that I've never been connected to anyone else, but we've both left each other on multiple occasions. And so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We go back and forth. If I'm being completely honest, he wasn't 100% available when we got together, so. I have a history of dating men who are not 100% available. Either because I don't want to commit, don't want them to commit, don't want it to be serious, don't want to have the pressure of them wanting it to be serious. So that's the story, guys. That is the story of a girl who has daddy issues, who is not ready to commit and is 47, almost 48 years old. I'm the girl your therapist warned you about. You better run. <laughs> All right, do you guys have any situations that happen when you grow up that impact your relationships now? Like that are you are keenly aware of? I mean, I think everything we have impacts us, but I'm very aware of it. If you do, let me know down below. All right, I hope you are well. Hopefully that sheds some light on where I'm coming from and my choice to be a single mom by choice and my choice to not be married. I'm good. I'm good, fam. I'll talk to you later. Bye.